When most people talk about classic gaming franchises, characters such as Mario, Sonic and Mega Man come to mind. However, for me, one other character is always included in the discussion. Wonder Boy! Now, with the release of the remake of Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap on modern consoles, I think it's about time we take a look back at Wonder Boy and ultimately one of the most varied and sometimes confusing gaming franchises of all time. Now, I was lucky enough to play all of the original games in the correct order, however, sometimes many years after their original release, but needless to say, the Wonder Boy franchise made up a large part of my gaming childhood. The original Wonder Boy was a fast-paced action platformer and was a smash hit in arcades back in the mid-80s. It immediately drew comparison to Super Mario Bros. with its side-scrolling action and bright graphics, and best of all, it had Sega's name all over it. The game was published by Sega and developed by a company called Escape, which would later be renamed to Westone. Wonder Boy's worldwide console debut would happen a year later in 1987 with the Master System port. However, my first encounter with Wonder Boy was on the Game Gear. So what is this first game all about? In this game, you'll be traveling across different landscapes in search of your girlfriend, Tanya, who has been captured by the Woodland King. It's pretty much all you need to know as you run head first through each level, jumping over obstacles and throwing hatchets like they're going out of fashion. At the top of the screen is your vitality meter. This serves as both your health and your timer, so that should give you some indication as to what you have to do. Get to the end of the stage without getting hit and do it fast. Most things in the game kill you in one hit, except rocks which you only trip over and then it takes some time off your timer. In order to keep your vitality high, you have to keep collecting fruit that randomly appears around the levels. Every so often, wee eggs appear containing various objects that'll help you along the way, such as your hatchet power up and a, a skateboard? So this seems a bit out of the ordinary, but trust me, this is just preparing us for some of the weirder parts of the game. The weirdest one that I've come across is the warp zone. Each level is divided up into four checkpoints and finding a warp will give you a bonus stage as well as advance you forward one checkpoint. But look at how this is actually done. Seemingly by random, a piece of fruit will transform into a handbag and once you collect this handbag, a lady descends from the heavens and takes you to the clouds. Why is fruit transforming into clothing accessories? According to the manual, this can be anything from a handbag to an umbrella to a pair of socks. One thing that's left out of the manual though is who this lady is. Seems a pretty large oversight to not include the identity of this heaven dwelling woman who comes down and abducts you mid game. No, but I'm trying to save my girlfriend. So after making our way through the world and throwing hatchets at anything that moves, we make it to the final boss and let the hatchets fly. This boss only has one face so it shouldn't pose much of a problem, just rain hatchets on his leotard wearing ass and pretty soon he's decapitated. And then he grows a lion head and flies off to the moon. Tanya is saved and everything's back to normal. If you look at Tanya's dialogue on the end screen, you'll notice that the hero isn't actually referred to as Wonder Boy, but by his real name Tom Tom. This is pretty much the cornerstone of how the rest of the series will progress. So from this point onwards, the Wonder Boy series will be split in two. This confused the hell out of me for years and I never knew what game to play next. You see, in the original license agreement between Sega and Westone, Westone owned the rights to the game, but not the characters. Naturally, Westone wanted to port the game to as many systems as possible, so in order to get around this, they teamed up with the Hudson Soft V, ported the game to NES with different characters, and rebranded it as Adventure Island. So Adventure Island would go on to have its own series, including games on the NES, Super Nintendo, TurboGrafx-16, and even on the Wii. Now, the style of these Adventure Island games would stick mainly to the same style as the original Wonder Boy games. However, the Sega Wonder Boy series would go off in its own direction. This was the series that I followed, and before long, it was time to enter Monster Land. The second game, called Wonder Boy and Monster Land, carries on from the first game, but all the running and jumping and action elements are completely gone. Now we have an RPG with interchangeable weapons and armor, swordplay, levels, RPG type stuff, essentially just a completely different game from the first. This game was first released in arcades, however it was its Master System port that I first played. The story here is that after Tom Tom defeated the evil king and rescued his girlfriend, people caught wind of his heroic deed and bestowed upon him the title of Wonder Boy. The world is a pretty nice place without that head changing king kicking around the place. But after a while, a fire breathing robot dragon called the Mecha Dragon appears and causes all sorts of hassle. Now, being a fire breathing robot dragon, he essentially turns Wonderland into Monsterland, and the people of Monsterland call upon Wonder Boy to save the day.
Clearly not happy with his new attire. I, I mean, it looks like he doesn't know what to do with his hands. Wonderboy gets stuck straight into Monsterland. So after speaking to some purple dude, Wonderboy grabs himself a sword and pulls a St. Patrick by getting straight to work driving the snakes out of Monsterland. As well as this, I find it kind of suspect that the first place that Wonderboy wants to stop in is the bar for some pre-fight drinks. Maybe Wonderboy's Irish? One new thing added to this game was the timer that constantly ticks down. If the timer reaches zero, then Wonderboy takes damage and the timer resets. There's items that restart the timer, but with this being an arcade game first and foremost, I'd hate to know the total amount of money that this godforsaken timer has eaten over the course of this game's arcade tenure. This game was meant to be played fast. But the absolute worst feature of this game? It has zero continues! When you die, that's it! If you mess up and die, then tough shit! Your ass is heading straight back to the purple dude to get a new sword and start straight back from square one. Yeah, you get an elixir here and there which kind of acts as a second life, but seriously? No continues! I know this is an arcade game, so this is probably a thing to try and get people to spend more money, but this isn't needed in the home console version. If you want to get this game beat, then you gotta knuckle down and you gotta get it done right. No screw-ups. Once you get used to its quirks though, this is a pretty fun action RPG game. The levels are pretty diverse, there's enough challenge to keep anyone going, and loads of loot to get to use to upgrade Wonderboy. Trust me though, you're going to need all the training and loot you can find for what's at the end of the game. After making your way to the final castle and defeating these jumping knight looking guys, you head inside to kick the mecha dragon's ass. What lies here though is the most grueling level you can imagine for the end of a game like this. Each floor has identical backgrounds and multiple forks that you can take, and if you take the wrong one, it leaves you in some random part of the map. For example, check this out. I jump on top of the platform, jump up to the next screen, and see it for literally a second before falling back down again. Apparently though, down is not the way this game wants you to go here. So it fires me back to some random screen that's not the place I came from. Once I do finally make it up onto those red blocks, you have to jump between them as they move. As a young budding gamer, this was the craziest thing I'd ever seen in a game, and it was a nightmare to figure out the patterns. This was right up there with the disappearing blocks from Mega Man. Once you do make it down the correct set of exits, you'll be greeted with this mecha robot looking hallway, and you know it's on. It's time for you to remember your training and fight the mecha dragon. His attacks punish you seemingly every time, and working out his pattern isn't an easy task because did I mention you have to restart the entire game if you die? Ultimately to beat this guy you have to heighten your senses, pull your socks up, and just pray that things go your way. Once you do work out a pattern, it's all plain sailing, and this guy is... Wait a second, that was just his first form? Now we're against the real Mecha Dragon, and you thought that first guy was bad? Clearly this guy was holding back inside of his fake dragon suit because now he's pissed. Every attack is just devastating, and you'll be sweating buckets just trying to stay alive, never mind landing a hut. So yeah, I never beat him. I, I probably never will. Uh, it turns out that there's like a legendary armor set that you're supposed to collect in order to stand even a remote chance of beating him, but I never knew where all the pieces were. And this was on the days before the internet, like the only way of finding out game information was sharing stories with your friends in the playground and telling them what you had found in exchange for what they had found. And not one of my mates had ever gotten the legendary armor set, and so none of us ever beat this game. It went back on the shelf and there it sat, a reminder that I failed to kill the dragon, and a reminder that Monster World is still a living hell for all of its inhabitants. A few years later on my birthday, my parents surprised me with a new game that they had seen and thought that I would like it. Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap I was happy to have a new Wonder Boy game, but ashamed at the same time that I might not know the story without completing the last game. Taking control of Wonder Boy once again would be a grueling task, given the fact that I failed so miserably against the Mecha Dragon. I loved the first two games though, so it was time to see where the Wonder Boy series would go next. I turned on the game, and text appeared on the screen. Overcoming various hardships, you have at last entered into the monster's castle. Your target is the dreaded dragon's room. But unbeknownst to you is the fact that the dragon has the power to invoke curses on his enemies. Like the emotional burden of not killing the last dragon wasn't enough of a curse. The text fades and BOOM! 
The game kicks off right as you enter the castle in the previous game. My senses were on full red alert. This game wasn't fucking around. It took the most grueling part of the previous game and threw you into the thick of it. I checked my inventory and saw that it started me off with the legendary gear that me or my friends could never find. I had a second chance. A chance to redeem myself. This time I wasn't going to let it beat me. I was going to kill the mecha dragon. Yes! I can finally put this game to rest. After all those years of self-doubt, I finally killed the mecha... Wait a second... You have to be joking. After getting turned into a dragon by the dragon's curse, the castle starts to crumble. With Wonder Boy, the action never stops. It's full-on heart racing madness all the time. But for now, it's time for us to get the hell out of here. After escaping in the nick of time, we're rewarded with a shot of the castle crumbling behind us, leaving in ruins what was once the hardest test of my gaming skills to date. Text appears again, and now proceed with your adventure is undertaken. Wonder Boy 3, The Dragon's Trap. Best opening ever. So the Dragon's Trap fixes nearly every small gripe I had with the previous game, and is considered by a lot of people to be the standout entry in the series. The timer, score and levels are gone, and in their place you're given a world that you can roam around in and explore, with a password that you can use to reload your game, which at the time was pretty new. It was even featured on the front of the box. In order to explore the entire world though, you'll have to change into different forms. Throughout the entire game you can become a dragon, a mouse, a piranha, a lion and a hawk, each with their own unique abilities. The game has certain points where you're allowed to change form, although later in the game you're given a Tasmanian sword that allows you to change it well. This is a bit difficult to pull off though. In order to change forms with the sword, you have to plug in a second controller, jump using the first controller, hold 2 on the second controller, and press 1 on the first controller. Why does it have to be so convoluted? I mean, could I not just like jump and press like a combination or something to get this to work? I mean, I've been challenged in games before, but never a challenge that required me to have three hands. Luckily this was fixed in the remake that's out now, but we'll get on to that a bit later. In order to unlock each of these different forms, you'll have to defeat each of the game's bosses, all dragons again. In the last game, we just had to deal with one robot dragon, but now we have dragons based on mummies, zombies, pirates, and samurais, all themed after each of the game's worlds. And herein lies the charm of this game that pulled me in and kept me hooked for so long. The world feels like a world, and it makes this point pretty early on once you get to the beach area. Now from the games I played at the time, I was still pretty much well trained that water was bad. Games like Castlevania killed you as soon as you hit the water, and games like Mario either had levels in water or out of water. Once I saw this area, my brain immediately noticed the potential hazard and the path I needed to take to overcome it. Once I made that first slip though and fell in the water, I was shocked to find a full blown world down there with its own challenges and enemies to kill. I knew I was running around on the ocean floor and that the beach still existed above me with all of its enemies waiting for me to surface. At the end of the beach was a small hut with a treasure chest and a shop, and after looting it the only way to go was back the way I came and explore some more. This game promoted exploration and challenged every game and sensibility I thought I had. At the time, this was the most advanced thing that I had ever played. Which brings me on to its level of difficulty. Dragon's Trap had a pretty standard difficulty curve, but I did notice that sometimes the game forced me to overcome challenges that almost seemed cruel. Some enemies were placed deliberately to taunt me, and the game also had this really weird way of dealing with getting hit. Once you get hit, you have a few frames of invincibility, which is standard in most games, and you have no control over your character until you hit the ground. The trouble is though is that if you get hit multiple times, you never touch the ground, and so you never get control back. You're just forced to sit there helpless as you watch your character literally get juggled around the screen. I dare say this phenomenon has claimed more than a few Master System controllers in its time out of sheer frustration. So once I collected all the armour, discovered all of the secrets that I could, and beat all of the game's bosses, it was time to beat the final boss. 
After my last experience with Wonder Boy, I wasn't willing to let this one get the better of me. It's time to storm the castle, and it's time to put to bed the horror that was the Mecha Dragon in that last game. There are no mazes to be found here, no weird out of the ordinary secrets or bad game mechanics to hold us back. This time we're decked out in legendary gear and we're ready to kick this dragon's ass. So after making it through the dragon's castle, I stood outside prepared for what would be behind the door. After all, this game started with the Mecha Dragon. What over the top, horrifying, ferocious creature would I have to kill next? Yep, a dragon with a face for a stomach. Plus he looks bored, kind of like he's just given up caring that this weird face has just appeared on his belly. But make no mistake, this guy is an absolute prick, but he's the last thing that stands between me and putting the Monsterland story to rest, and I'm not going to back out this time, this time I have to kill the dragon. Once the dragon is killed and we collect the salamander cross to break the spell, we reflect on the journey that we've had. We see all the forms leave Wonder Boy and he's returned to his human self. As a child, I thought back to all the time I'd spent playing Wonder Boy. This truly felt like an ending to me. The ending that I denied myself the last time around. And now, after the journey that saw Wonder Boy in the jungle saving his friend, to saving the world from an evil dragon, Wonder Boy enters his home and the final text appears. And it was as if the game was speaking directly to me and about the journey I had taken. The long battlefield journey has finally ended. The tales of your gallant and heroic action will be passed down from one generation to another throughout eternity. And for me, it would be a journey that I would always remember. It showed me that games could tell much bigger stories than I had thought possible, and that challenge could be overcome with a sense of purpose and satisfaction. My time in Monsterland was over, but it would be an experience that I would remember forever. After this I would take a hiatus from Wonder Boy and it would be many years before I would hear from the series again. I had completed the 8-bit Wonder Boy trilogy and was happy to let the series rest as one of the biggest adventures I had ever taken in video games. Little did I know though, that in between Monsterland and Dragon's Trap, an arcade game was released in Japan that I would never hear about at the time and would later be ported to the Mega Drive and start an all new Wonder Boy trilogy. One that, for me at least, would contain the low point and the high point of the series, and one that would take me almost two decades to complete. <laughs> 